So next up is Richard Tynan, who is a technologist at Privacy International uh, in the UK, an organisation committed to fighting for the right to privacy across the world. Uh, Tynan's work focuses on the area of surveillance technologies, specifically wired and wireless surveillance mechanisms and the strategies employed by cyber criminals to harvest private information from a wide range of uh, ubiquitous devices such as cell phones and personal computers. Uh, also, Richard Tynan visited Guardian headquarters with Mustafa al Bassam, former core member of LulSec, to examine the way GCHQ obliterated the Guardian's laptops, storing copies of top secret documents provided to them by the whistleblower Edward Snowden. So, thank you very much. Um, so I hope most people in the audience at this stage realize when you press the delete key that things don't get deleted. Um, at this stage, most people know it, uh, but unfortunately, GCHQ and the NSA take this to a little bit of a uh, whole other level. So as many of you know, The Guardian potentially had some documents from the whistleblower Edward Snowden. Uh, they were reporting on them and the NSA and GCHQ didn't really like that. I'm sure many people are aware what they did to Glenn Greenwald's partner in London Heathrow uh, as he was transiting through, and I believe he was detained under a terrorism act. So, pretty draconian. They threatened numerous times uh, to shut down The Guardian, go to the legal route, go various other different routes, and in the end, it was decided to basically nuke the docks, just get rid of them. So for us, as privacy advocates in, and, and working, <clears throat> working in various different countries where the ability to delete something is actually a matter of life and death, um, if you have stuff on your machine in relation to homosexuality in certain countries, that can be an extremely uh, serious offence. And many human rights activists around the world rely on being able to actually delete stuff, but as it turns out, it's a lot harder than you might think. So the agreement was that the, the, the information would be destroyed and myself and Mustafa found this whole uh, ordeal very, very interesting and we wanted to see if we could actually learn anything from it. And it turns out I think you can learn quite a bit from it. Um, so if anybody's not familiar with it, the picture at the top is uh, when they went in and G the arrangement was that GCHQ could not touch the um, the hardware, and so therefore the GCHQ people uh, instructed the Guardian staff uh, in what to do. Now this is quite good because this is the first time we have ever had a machine containing top secret material being destroyed in public. So it essentially gives us a blueprint potentially for what we would need to do if we want to delete our stuff, but it also potentially shows how incredibly vulnerable we are and how our devices can betray us pretty much uh, all day, every day. So down at the bottom was the, uh, the picture that was released by The Guardian and uh, we were not happy with that. We wanted to get in and get a closer look. We were at an event with uh, one of the guys actually on, on the left-hand side, Dave Bleichen, who invited us to come in and take some detailed photos and then go contact the companies to find out uh, what was done, why it was done, and whether the companies actually knew anything about what their products did. And I'm still not sure they do. Um, so this matters for, as I said, many reasons in the countries that we work in to be able to actually just get rid of stuff. Uh, and I don't just mean stuff you don't want because it's taken up too much space. I mean, as a journalist, uh, uh, people, uh, whistleblowers who reveal information to you, as, as uh, solicitors, as doctors, you may have to be called upon to delete stuff. And indeed, in many countries, there's data protection law, which mandates that you put data that is no longer required beyond use. So one may argue that if this is the procedure that has to be followed when GCHQ wants to delete stuff, Maybe this is the, the procedure that we ought, to be, um, we ought to be expecting companies and various other different agencies to adhere to. But it's going to be pretty expensive um, if you have to nuke stuff every time you want to delete it. And I hope nobody now, or at least anybody who has sold their laptop, hard drive, mobile phone, or anything 
uh, uh, second hand, uh, I hope you're getting pretty nervous right now because there was an old thing, still goes on for security experts, they go in and they'll buy a lot of secondhand stuff on eBay and then try and get stuff off it and contact the people. They're genuinely interested in security, they just want to let them know what, what they've done wrong. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to get some information out of this without having to go through the pain of being contacted by a security researcher who's found your most intimate emails and photographs on a hard drive that you sold five years ago. So the first one that I think is, is quite interesting is the trackpad. Um, you kind of, it's, it's really the only way, other than the keyboard, it's the only way for you to get information into the, into the device. And it turns out that it's capable, if you see on the, on the right hand side, uh, I just have the image on the left hand side so you can see a little bit of context about what this is. This is actually the underside of the trackpad. And on the top right is where, uh, with the red box around it, is the chip that was actually targeted by GCHQ. No other chips. As you can see, there's a yellow one and an orange one also on the same board. They didn't care. They went straight for the red one. Nothing else was touched. It can store two megabytes of data. And as you'll see, there's going to be a pattern through this entire presentation, which is if th their threat model is if they're able to get information out of one of those chips, they have to assume somebody else will, will be able to. So if they want to get rid of it, they know they have to get rid of that chip. Unfortunately, Apple didn't respond to any of our questions about what their devices do. Um, this is a... a, a um, uh, an update that was on uh, Apple's website, which is, and this image is not thanks to me, this is Mustafa's uh, uh, sense of humor at work in the presentation. Um, the, I mean, many of these things I didn't even realize had their own individual firmware, their own individual processors, their own individual, they basically are their own individual computers. The trackpad has its own capability to do a hell of a lot of stuff. And uh, as you can see, you can actually update, uh, upload it or update it. Now, if, if you as a consumer can update it, malware can get in and do some pretty funky stuff with it as well. Uh, and just so that nobody accuses me of being an Apple hater, there is also an update for Dell Touchpad. It didn't take me long to find one, but I'm sure if I went looking for HP and various other uh, manufacturers like that, I would find one as well. So. The official guidelines, Mustafa contacted um, uh, the government. They claim cybersecurity, they want to keep you safe, they want to keep your data safe. But it turns out when you actually ask them how to do it, they won't tell you. So there is a, uh, there's various different information assurance notes that uh, detail what you're supposed to do. Now, thankfully, we've been able to find through various different leaked material and publicly available information from other countries, we've been able to piece together what they were doing. But it's pretty bad that the UK government won't just tell you how to protect your stuff. Um, so the first one was a, a leaked document for, on WikiLeaks from, I think, 2009. Uh, it was the uh, Joint Services Publication 440, which basically lists many of the components in your uh, computer and what you need to do to get rid of them. Um, mostly when they say destroy, the footnote tells you that you need to disintegrate, disintegrate, pulverize, shred, or melt. Now that, to me, even PhD in computer science for working in tech for donkey's years, I didn't even know you needed to do that. So how are most people supposed to know that that's what this means? And it's important, that just because they say it's top secret, that, I think that's just a label for they think it's important. And you have a label for stuff you call important, whatever that might be, family photos, or it could be some, some other sensitive information. But when you need to destroy it, is this what you have to do? I don't think you should have to do this, but unfortunately, this is what they think you have to do. And the important thing is, uh, Mustafa found this really interesting passage, uh, two interesting passages actually in the uh, Joint Services 440 uh, uh, document about um, sanitizing of material. And crucially, investigative journalists, pressure groups, and investigation agencies, the people who are supposed to investigate them to make sure they're not screwing up or not doing anything wrong, are part of the, the people that they consider a threat. That doesn't say too much about what they think of oversight. So we were also able to then go, we went to Australia, New Zealand, the USA, some, uh, some countries were more open than others about this. But the, 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 the thing here is that they actually boldly state that in most cases, if you've got a hard drive, 
The only way to dispose it safely is destruction. I wasn't told that. I don't know anybody else who's told that. And if you look, actually, down below, if you try to do sanitiz sanitization and you don't do the destruction, what happens is the classification of the documents contained on that device doesn't change. So if you started with top secret documents and you sanitize it but didn't destroy it, they're still top secret. That device has to be treated in a top secret way, i.e. you haven't done anything and those docs are recoverable. That's not particularly good either. Uh, and the same applies for secret, but when you get down to confidential stuff, I don't know what that is, uh, maybe what the, the, the menu is in the canteen, that is then becomes uh, unclassified. These ones here are to show that it's not just about the act of uh, breaking stuff up into bits, chopping it up into bits, doing various different things. They actually have gone so far as to say that whatever the dust size is that comes out of whatever process you engage in has to be of a certain size. Three millimeters, six millimeters, nine millimeters, or 12 millimeters. And for the last uh, four or five years working with Privacy International, we've been sneaking into trade shows undercover to, um, am I moving too close to one or the other? Uh, sneaking into the trade shows to gain access to the companies that supply the equipment for these things. They supply both uh, hacking equipment or forensic equipment and uh, these kind of destruction stuff. And they actually have a, a, a big, like a, a big washing machine and you just throw in the hard drive. It does this all for you, sifts out all the bits. So the, the, there's a mesh in there that makes sure all the bits that come out, any of the bits that are too big, it goes through again and again and again. In the end, all that comes out is a big pile of dust. And as you'll see, that's exactly what happened in The Guardian. Um, Another really interesting one here is they actually expressly state that there must be two people to supervise this. When GCHQ went to the Guardian, how many people did they have from GCHQ to supervise the destruction? Two. So they were, it's not like we're, we're trying to piece together from like a, a, an absence of information. We're trying to piece together all the various different bits. And I think we've built up a pretty accurate picture based upon what we've managed to get from uh, both from WikiLeaks and from the, the, uh, the other countries who, who have revealed some information about what they were trying to do. And this goes into to Australia, USA, Canada. They mention the same things, one's disintegration, uh, but uh, ultimately they're all the same size uh, particles that need to come out at the end, so it's not good enough just to take a hammer to your device or take a screwdriver to it. You gotta make sure this thing is turned to dust. Um, so if we go on to what, they're, what, what the, the, the components actually look like, um, I think most people would agree that the hard disk is a pretty obvious candidate for storing information. So obviously they went to town on that on the right. But interestingly enough, in the, in the top right, what they did was they went after the controller of the hard drive. So not just the place where the data is stored, they went after the place that actually controls the read write. And as I'll show you everything I'm about to show you here, uh, people subsequently have shown uh, malware in the wild that has been exploiting this. So the inference would be that GCHQ knew this was possible either because they were doing it or they knew another intelligence agency was doing it and therefore that's why they had to get rid of this stuff. Uh, for most people, uh, RAM, maybe you don't think that that can betray you or store data, but unfortunately it can. And this was actually an eye-opener for, for me because uh, it, it pointed me to, compo to, to components in a machine that I just assumed when you turned it off, data was gone. It was a starting point to then go in down that rabbit hole about what your memory can actually store, why it can store your encryption keys, how those encryption keys can persist sometimes for years after you've turned the device off uh, because of burn-in, but that's a, a little bit too detailed. Uh, and the battery controller, uh, they were very interested in what your battery was doing, and interestingly enough, uh, a number of people, a number of research groups have actually showed that by measuring the current draw, you can, you can uh, infer a lot of things about what the device is actually doing. And as you can see here, unsurprisingly now, I hope, there's been an update for your battery controller on an Apple device. So the software is not just this fixed thing that is perfect and only doing something very, very small. It's obviously doing something important enough and uh, uh, I, yeah, I guess important enough that it warrants an update. It also warrants an update because potentially there are security vulnerabilities in here. And this thing down here in the bottom right, 
This one really annoyed me. This was your bog standard keyboard. This was just the chip that was stored in your keyboard and it turns out it can store some amount of information. And when they went through, they target that little itty bitty thing which is about the size of a little fingernail. Uh, everybody here, I assume, uses USB sticks. Uh, if you're a journalist, solicitor, doctor, whoever, you have obligations, some legal, some ethical in respect of uh, data handling procedures. Everybody obviously has to follow the Data Protection Act in, their, uh, in the course of their business. This is what they do when they want to press delete to a USB stick. That contained top secret material. So ask yourself, what's your top secret material and what are you gonna do to delete it? This is what happened when we tried to call the companies or contact the companies. Uh, the top right had a very good back and forth with HP, and then as soon as things started to get a little bit more detailed, uh, they started slapping confidential on everything, implying that we were going down a rabbit hole that they would potentially be a, then be able to prevent us from going public, and I have no interest in knowing this stuff just for myself. Well, I do have a little bit of an interest in knowing it for myself, but. The purpose of this was to, to reveal it publicly so everybody could know if the HP devices could betray them. And this was Dell's. The Dell's one is a very interesting one. If you want to go to PI's website, you'll be able to see uh, the actual reply. But I can summarize this by saying, basically, we have no idea what chips are specifically in each one of our devices. We have many different manufacturers who supply us with many different chips. And all we really care about is that when the key gets pressed, that's what comes up on screen. And they also said that it would potentially be uh, Dell confidential information in terms of if they were to release schematics. And so you can say this is all theoretical and this is all nonsense and GCHQ were just uh, uh, being overly cautious. And maybe they were, except for since then, we've had all sorts of malware that has been released that has exploited almost every single thing they went in to destroy. We had the bad USB. The USB controller was also destroyed on the, the MacBook. I didn't go into that. We have Equation Group, which was supposedly uh, Russian-based that was going after the firmware on hard drives, as you saw on the top right uh, picture. Thunderstrike to take over your Mac firmware. And then Irate Monk, which provides uh, software. Actually, it's on a, a poster outside. There's a very good one with a, 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 a poster with the Ant catalog, some of the Ant catalogs uh, text on it, and Irate Monk is one of the ones out there, so if you want, you can go out and buy it and have a look. Uh, and with all of this, I, I, I try to keep emphasizing that you need to bring this back to what does it mean for you, because it's not just an exercise for me and for us to go and do this, because as we move into the future with Internet of Things, smart cities, I saw uh, Vladam with um, pre-crime, it's already here. Predictive policing has been rolled out in many US cities. When you get stopped, it'll scan your license plate, try and, and bring up your Facebook profile, try and figure out who your Facebook friends are. Are any of those suspects or any of those people, bad people, whatever bad is at that time? And we're going through, we're going down this, this rabbit hole of where we're, we're, we're trusting these devices more and more. In fact, some of them we don't even know exist. We're just walking along, CCTV cameras all over the place, and yet, sitting in the back of all of this is someone who knows how to get the information out of them. And you can't find out what information is in there. So, I guess the headline is that GCHQ doesn't trust Apple devices to hold its top secret information. Should you? That's a choice for you. The whole tinfoil hat argument of, oh, everybody needs to chuck their MacBook Air in the bin is nonsense. But at least now you can make decisions about if you've got sensitive information, should you put it on your MacBook or should you put it somewhere else? Just because we have information about Apple doesn't mean that we'd have exactly the same information if we had, for example, a big Dell or, or, or a whole load of Dell laptops. It just so happened that these were MacBooks. And I think it comes down to a more fundamental level, which is, do we have a right to know where our data is, even on our device? Because I don't, at this point in time, uh, given that the information can be all over the place, in, even in the device itself, uh, is the device ours? And I think most people, unfortunately, now think that, no, the devices aren't ours. And therefore, we may not even have a right to delete it in some instances, that the data may, we may hand over to somebody else, and suddenly they're custodian of of our data and potentially our future. And the, the uh, how long do I have left? 
Five, perfect. Okay, so um, this all fits into to, it fits into actually a lot of the work that you've seen in the two presentations previously uh, to what we call uh, data exploitation, which is years ago, you went to an interview, you went to get a bank loan, and you were judged on your merits. You sat down at a table, somebody looked at you, you had a bit of a, an interaction, you got a yes or a no. By the way, this is about as uh, not, we're going to get a little bit racist, ageist, and sexist in a minute, uh, because unfortunately that's what computers do. And so this is how we capture what the law presumes, and that is that us on the left interacting with everybody else on the right, not just governments, it's just everybody in society, uh, or our banks, or our lawyers, or our, or our doctors, we fill out some bit of information that we know what we're giving over, there's a trust there. And we send that over and we get an answer back. Somewhere along the way, I think it was a Tuesday, or it could have been a Monday, uh, we were not trusted anymore. We became liars. And it became no longer trust. It was, you will trust what you say, but we want independent verification. And all of a sudden, we had these little uh, data representations of ourselves. You can call it a credit score, you can call it your medical history, you can call it Facebook profile, whatever you want to call it. There is a little representation of you somewhere in some company server. And they're using that to cross-reference to see if you're a liar. Then what happened, I think it was the Wednesday or the Thursday, they said, well, look, screw it. We don't even want to know what you're going to tell us. We're just going to go straight to the data that we can collect independently from you. And this is not the scenario that the current legal structure is familiar with. The legal structure is familiar with that. But this is what we have. And all this itty bitty bits of, bits of data, and you've heard uh, metadata, you've heard cameras, various other different bits pulled in together, feed into basically a mirror representation of yourself, but a different one for every single company that has information on you. They can pull it together, they can cross-reference it, they can get a better profile on you. Whatever better means is their definition of better. Do they get more money out of you? It's not whether it's more accurate, and I would argue you don't even want them to have a more accurate profile anyway. But this uh, doppelganger measure, everybody has them there beside each other, we're all compared against each other, such that if you do something and I'm similar to you, automatically the machine will assume that I'm going to do the same thing. And we can call these individual mirrors, mirrors, or and there's legal mirrors like the shareholder register or uh, the land register. So if the land register says you own something, but somebody else says they own it, the land register takes precedent. So rather than calling them these mirrors, mirrors, they're actually just Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, anybody who's given you information, whether it's met or who you've given your information to, knowingly or unknowingly. It could be stored in one of, those, the, one of those chips. It could be sent from one of those chips without your knowledge. All collected. And there's some very interesting, uh, 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 a very interesting ecosystem which is now built up, which is our devices down here in the bottom left, which are basically hardwired to betray you. They are hardwired to get as much information out as possible into, uh, my background is in artificial intelligence, so into storage and processing engines, AI, machine learning, pa pattern matching, probabilistic decision making, such that they can make better models of you. Now, better is, by their definition, not better for you. It's do you spend more money on Amazon? Amazon can care less if they show you advertisements you want to see. They want to show you advertisements for stuff you buy. And it goes then into the users, because we're not the users of the system. We're not the users of our devices. This has all been built in so that you have either got or not gotten the job before you even set foot in the interview. There was a, a recent story by Vice where they uh, exposed uh, an agency that was doing uh, background checks on people and doing some pretty nasty stuff to get some information on them. It didn't matter what they put in their application. All that mattered was what this uh, agency said you were or you were or whoever was. And the, the push into, into or the, the, the pervasiveness of these devices, what we saw with the uh, MacBook and uh, the keyboards are now in Barbies. And the information is not just stored and collected. It's only one software update away from going from your child's Barbie to, I don't know who makes Barbie, but whoever the, the, the manufacturer is of Barbie. You had VTech as well with all sorts of photographs from various different people. And we're even getting uh, digestible and uh, renewable sensors. You take them, 
18 of them will go all over your body, sends various different things. This was where I did my work, my PhD, but the, the smart Samsung Smart TV, I don't know if anybody remembers, it was always on, always listening, always sending your, your communications back to Samsung in God knows what country, with God knows what legal regime applying to it, and God knows what protections there were for you. And this is where we get a little bit racist, sexist, and, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> something. This is how machines need to think. This is uh, how artificial, one mechanism by which artificial intelligence can be intelligent or can exhibit intelligence and can learn from past experiences. It can partition people based on certain characteristics. Now, those characteristics it's need, it needs to collect. So these could be race, gender, and age, and it can position people. Now, if everybody over there, now granted, I know babies can't get loans, so I apologize for that uh, uh, the baby over there being included. I'm fairly certain young girls and young boys can't, but please just view it as the adults who are able to get loans over there got them and defaulted on their loans. What's the machine supposed to do if all it has is age, race, and gender? Because the goal of the machine is not to behave ethically or legally. The goal of the machine is to figure out who is going to default on a loan. That's it. And we don't know what the criteria are that it's going to come up with. And in fact, we can't even probe it to see what the, the criteria are. And I built these systems, so I know. And this is, this is the example of a rule that a machine would, would, would come up with. If your race is of type 1 and your gender is of type 2, you're going to default on your loan, irrespective of anything else that you want to feed into this system. So I'm going to finish now with this, which is that um, Many of the things that can be used to identify us are also things that can be very uh, sensitive health information. So one of the, one of the, the, the big things is um, uh, latent information. So for example, how hard you hit keys, how fast you type, uh, how loud you talk. As an Irish person, I tend to talk very, very fast and usually very loud as I have more drink. But the faster you talk and the time taken to complete tasks are a fingerprint of you. You average those out, and your phone gets all of these. And you remember that little thing in your trackpad? What's in there? Is that every single key press I made? Yes, it is. But does it store it, and is it looking for these kind of patterns? So that even if I move device, even if I try and be anonymous, I'm still stuck. And they're also good indicators of health conditions which is a sensitive, very, very sensitive personal information. It can be indicative of uh, um, all sorts of age-related things or any sort of uh, progressive uh, diseases. And indeed, we've now seen Facebook admitting that they don't do racial profiling. What they do is they try and figure out your ethnic affinity. So if you have an affinity for Asians back in Ireland, that means something that I don't think Facebook wants it to mean. So on that note, this is what you may have to do to your actual uh, uh, hardware. There might have been a clue in there from years ago, of course, big sci-fi fan being a techie. But the key message for here is that our networks, our devices, and our services should not betray us. Unfortunately, we accept the betrayal on a daily basis. And hopefully, some artist somewhere is going to, maybe here, is going to produce a piece of artwork, not a two-hour film, a painting, a piece of music, short piece of music that is going to connect. Because I can, I can stand here and talk for however long I've spoken for. Nobody should have to listen to me speak to, to see this. Artists should be able to connect with people viscerally and punch them in the gut and say why this is a problem, because I can't. Thank you. Thank you.